So good afternoon. My name is Leola Carter, and I am your host for today's webinar. I am a SCORE mentor in the Minnesota Division, where we have over 90 volunteers serving Manatee and Sarasota counties. I am also on the Education Committee and excited to bring to you today's presentation on secrets to owning a franchise with Jim McClaney. And Jim, I didn't ask you how to pronounce your name, so I hope I got that right. That was really uh, cool. I have operated a franchise style business for just over 26 years. So looking forward to today's presentation. But first, a little bit more about us here at SCORE. We are a nationwide nonprofit organization that is an independent part of the Small Business Administration. What SCORE can do for you? We provide free mentoring and educational services such as this webinar. We can help you in all stages of your business from that first initial thought process all the way up to when it is time to sell. To find us, you can visit our website at score.org backslash Minnesota, where you can find all of these services. And today would not be possible if it weren't for our sponsors and community partners that we have listed here. And now it is time to introduce Jim McCaney, who is a consultant with Framnet and is helping to educate aspiring entrepreneurs on options for their business ownership. In just one second, I will stop sharing and I believe Jim will be able to share his slides. Let me get those. You can hear me, yeah? Yes, I can hear you. That's good. Excellent, excellent. Let me just get the slides going here. And to let participants know, you will be receiving a copy of the slides and the video pre presentation in your email in just a few days. Uh, if you do have any questions as Jim's presenting, you can put those in Q&A. And I didn't even ask him if he was going to answer as we went along or at the end. Um, and to let a few people know, we're having a little tiny trouble bit with audio um, with Jim, but um, some of it was pretty clear during our, our testing. So hopefully we won't have any oh, troubles. And here you can, comes your screen. You can see that now, yeah? I can. Excellent. Okay. And, and good afternoon, everyone. And, and thanks for joining. I do hope my internet hangs on here. Apologies for not having my video on, but I am trying to reclaim as much bandwidth as I can so that you get the most out of this. Um, so uh, I'm gonna do a little bit today. I, I, my hope today is that I frame a little bit about um, who we are at FranNet and um, how we help aspiring entrepreneurs and people considering business ownership. And then I'm going to take us through a bit more about the details of the franchise model, as well as then talk a little bit about how we try to help people here at FranNet. Okay, so just a little bit of background on on much the one of the typical kinds of clients that t find their way to friend that. Um, I am someone who was in the corporate world for many, many years, 30 years actually, and I decided uh, at age 50 that I was going to try to take a detour and do something different. And I started to, I was actually a client of FriendNet. So I worked with a consultant the same way I work with clients today. And, um, you know, my background was in banking and financial services. Um, if you can believe it, uh, when I got into franchising, I became a multi-unit franchise operator for a uh, one of the national hair care brands. So um, I'm kind of the classic example of someone who got into a business that they knew nothing about other than I got my hair cut every five weeks. But um, that's the beauty of franchising is that the franchisor provides you with a lot of the structure and the training on the things that you don't know that you need to know in order to be successful in the business. I put that picture on the left in here. I uh, spent three years working out in India when I was um, in banking. And I put this picture in here because uh, I... Business ownership is getting comfortable outside your own skin and that was great there 
Um, let me see if I can advance this. Oops, back up. So a little bit about Fran. We're a uh, we're, we're a consulting practice or an advisory practice brokerage, however you want to call it. We're all pretty good at what we do. Um, there's over a hundred of us now spread across the United States and Canada. Um, I'm here in the Tampa Bay area myself as well, um, although I work with clients all, all across the United States. So there's really no restriction as to, to where I can try to help folks. And as you can see, um, you know, whether it's through SCORE or SBDC, you know, we're really trying to um, be a partner and a resource for organizations who are really helping uh, people like yourself think about what possibilities could be for you for and that um and, and, you know kiddingly sometimes i say we're like e-harmony for business but with a better outcome but when i say that what i really mean is um our business is is spent more around uh, education right so many people coming to us with um a level of understanding about franchising our goal and our hope is that we can help them to understand the model uh, even when they came to the conversation, so offering prospects choices so that they can make informed decisions. We work with about 300 different franchises today, which sounds like a lot, but there's actually over 4,000 in the United States. So we're a bit picky. Um, we do pre-screen. Uh, one of the things I love about our model is we have a team in our home office who, uh, both on the way into our portfolio and on an ongoing basis is constantly reviewing the franchisors whom we introduce to, to make sure that they're qualified and, and that they're um, up to standard and, and that um, they're going to, they're going to be uh, ready to take on the clients that we, that we bring to them. So that's really um, what, what we do there. I should say also, we're a no cost resource to our clients. Um, it's really the, the franchisor who will remunerate FranNet if there's a um, decision made to invest in a particular franchise. So let's talk a little bit about business ownership. You know, there's really three ways that we think about it that someone can get into business. The first one is start a business from scratch, right? So you've got that bright idea. Uh, you've got a blank piece of paper. You're going to structure your, your own business, right? So you're building that in its entirety um, on your own. And while that's energizing and invigorating, um, History has told us that it's not always as successful um, because you're doing a lot of trial and error and there's a lot of time and there's a lot of money standing up that business. The second option that we see is people buying an existing business on the right side here. So maybe that's an independent mom and pop uh, business that's in your community and, and you know they've hit a point in time where they are thinking about uh, exiting for themselves, maybe it's retirement, and you might buy that business or consider buying that business. And we think that's a great option for the right person, but it also has to be the right business. So the the encouragement we always give is uh, make sure that you're doing your due diligence there and you're understanding not only the business model, but also the motives of the uh, seller so that you understand uh, what's behind this and making sure that uh, this business is a continuing entity after they leave and as you pick it up. And then the third one is really the one we're going to talk more about and develop today. It's buying a franchise. So we're going to talk more on that model. Um, let's start with just the basics of what, what is a franchise, right? So a franchise, it's just another form of business and distribution, but it really provides a license to use the name, the trademarks, the products and services, and the business systems. And so the advantage there is oftentimes you'll see name recognition, You'll be stepping into a business that has a track record, and you'll have the structure of those systems, which we're going to talk a bit more about in another slide. And then in exchange for that, as a franchisee coming into a system, you're going to uh, pay over to the franchisor an initial franchise fee. That's a one-time fee. That's going to give you rights to a territory. It's going to give you the right to use the franchise's name, and it's going to give you the training and the support you need in order to launch your business. And then you're also going to be expected to pay ongoing royalties, usually described as a percentage of revenues. And the way I think about royalties is that's really the compensation that you're paying over to the franchisor for the ongoing support that you're going to draw from their team and the affiliates that they bring in for other resources. And it's also going to be what funds the product development to make sure that your business is staying relevant and competitive 
in the markets in which it serves. Okay, so pretty straightforward, I think. But you know, a lot of times people come to franchising thinking that it's um, all quick service restaurants and uh, fast food. And you know, that's a great category. Food is a terrific category in franchising, but it's not the only category in franchising. And so, you know, you can start to see here that franchises span across over 90 different industries. So I think of that and I say, there's usually something for everyone in terms of a match. It's really just a matter of whether working with a client, I see some that they really want to go forward with it. But, you know, looking at that wheel that we have on this page, you see products, you see services, you see businesses that serve consumers. You might see other businesses that provide services to other businesses. You might also think about businesses that have a brick and mortar physical presence. Sometimes it's a home-based business. Or I also see mobile businesses in the franchise world where the business is driving to the location of the client in order to deliver the product or the service. Interestingly, one in seven franchises are veteran owned. That's actually a higher percentage than the ratio of veterans in the US population. And I think what that says is veterans, um, you know, veterans typically come out of the military with. Uh, strong adherence to systems and an affinity for systems. And that's really what a franchisor is looking for, is they're looking for candidates to operate locally that are going to follow a system and be successful. Here's a look at some of the types of franchises. So I said it's not just fast food, right? So then the logical question is, okay, Jim, what is it? You know, and this is just a little bit of an example of some of the categories, you know, but you might be surprised sometimes that some of the local businesses in your community that provide maybe some of the services you see on this page, they actually might be a franchise and maybe you just didn't realize that, right? But, um, you know, you can look here, you, you see you see on here a whole range of categories, again, products, services, some that you could see being in a physical space or perhaps home-based or, or mobile as well. So in, in, in essence, I mentioned that franchising is really about the business systems. And I think sometimes people think, Part of what they're getting with a franchise is they're they're really saying that they're going to have a quality product out in the market. And yeah, quality product is important, but really what you're buying in a franchise as a local operator is you're really um, trying to attach to these business systems because the franchisor has oftentimes had years of experience perfecting and optimizing these different kinds of systems and documenting them so that you can replicate them and execute them in the market that you own. So if you think about marketing and sales, right? Those are the systems that are going to help you not only promote your business locally, but also to grow your business. Operation systems are going to help you to ensure that you have a quality product um, rolling out every time that you deliver a service to your, to your clients. And then lastly, accounting systems are important because you really do need a set of books and records that's going to be able to um, keep track of the performance of your business and also key performance metrics, whether it be for you as the owner, understanding the metrics of your business, or maybe it's the metrics of your peers who are other franchisees. So you can understand how your business is performing relative to others who own other territories. So it's really these business systems that are the, the most critical part of franchising, in my opinion. Um, I'm a pretty balanced guy and I'll say, you know, it's not for everyone, right? So there are advantages, um, disadvantages. I, I like to think of it as there's trade-offs, right? Um, like everything in life, there are trade-offs. And some of these we've already talked about, right? There's those on the advantages, there's that benefit of name recognition, right? You show up in a market and your name over the door is a name that's maybe already recognized because of the presence of that franchise in other locations, We've already talked about the business systems. I'm going to share with you a few slides later on about this thing called the franchise disclosure document. Um, it's a great um, set of transparent information about a franchise that you can look at when you're considering and researching a particular franchise. You also become part of a franchise family. I'll tell you, when I was in that national hair care chain, I probably tapped my fellow franchisees, some of them who've been in business for 30, 40 years in that brand, to help me think about the decisions that I needed to make to be a good business owner. That doesn't mean that I didn't go to the franchisor as well, but you know, that whole idea of having a franchise family, I think was really powerful for me when I was in this business. 
We already talked about training and support, whether that's on the front end or on an ongoing basis. And I should say that training oftentimes is not only for you as the local owner or franchisee, but it will be for um, perhaps uh, members of your leadership team or even people that are delivering the service for your business in your market. Marketing expertise, right? Um, you know, these days, more and more of this is around digital presence and social media. But um, whether it be the franchise or building those resources in-house themselves for your use or by bringing in third-party partners, marketing is an incredibly important advantage today in differentiating your business amongst and, and from your competition. There's also purchasing power. Um, businesses that require uh, third-party services or maybe it's equipment to get started, the franchisor generally has stronger purchasing power because they're bringing uh, a volume of candidates, multiple franchisees to that supplier, probably getting a better price than you would get if it was you or I going out on our own trying to open this business and acquiring that same equipment in order to operate. And there is a lower failure rate in franchises. In fact, the SBA did a study some years ago that showed that in five years time, 95% of franchises were still operating. And that's a significantly uh, more attractive uh, outcome than what we've seen on the first scenario we were talking about, which is starting up a business from scratch. Actually, that's probably more like 50% success rate in five years. On the consideration side or the disadvantages side, yes, there is that licensing fee we talked about. So there is some money that has to be paid over at the front end in order to participate. This shows here there are fewer industry options. I still think there are many industries, but certainly there are going to be industries that don't have a presence in franchising. But as we saw before, over 90 industries have an opportunity to participate as a franchise. There are going to be the rules and restrictions, right? We're back to those systems again and the structure. Um, but, you know, that is, um, you know, when I when I think about that, I go to the next one, only sell their own products. When I owned my hair salons, um, I had people come in that made things like really nice jewelry and whatnot that, you know, they wanted me to Think about displaying that at my point of sale where the customer came in. And um, as much as I thought that stuff was great, I couldn't do it because it wasn't part of the brand. It wasn't part of what we delivered through that brand. So you can oftentimes only sell the products related to your brand. There's the ongoing royalty payments we talked about, percentage of revenue. I would say think of that as maybe 5 6% of your top line revenues is being paid back to the franchisor on some frequency, usually monthly. And then of course we have territory restrictions. I think this is a pro and a con, right? Because the pro side of this is, well, the con side of this, I guess, is that it's gonna tell you that you can only operate your business within a certain geographic boundary. But it's also going to tell you that um, it's gonna be clear to you as to whether anyone else can come in and operate in that same territory using the same brand you have. So you might have exclusive rights in a territory or there might be some restriction on how many um, uh, of the same brand a franchisor is, is looking to uh, set up in that area. So that's all spelled out in the contract. And then of course we have that structured operating system. It's here as a disadvantage only because there are people that I work with who are great candidates for business ownership, but it's pretty clear that they wanna do their own thing and they're probably not going to be the type of person that's gonna follow a structured operating system that's someone else to find. I wish them well. They go out, they are very, oftentimes very successful in business on their own, but they're probably not the best candidate for a franchise where we are looking for that structured system. The franchise disclosure document. Um, uh, franchising in the United States is actually regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. And I like to say that this is one of the areas, you've all heard the old joke, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help. Well, I actually think actually this is an area where the government really is trying to help us, right? Because they require each franchisor to document and distribute to anyone who is a prospective franchisee looking at their franchise, a um, thick document that's updated at least once a year by the franchisor. And it gives you a ton of information and a ton of transparency around uh, the overall health of that franchise, as well as the expectations between yourself and the franchisor. So here on this first page, you start to see some of the examples of the table of contents. And the FTC is very prescriptive about literally every single chapter of that FDD that has to be circulated. 
So you'll see information about the franchisor themselves. How long has this brand been in business? What's the experience of the business and its leadership team? How long have they been with this franchise? How long have they been in this industry? You'll see information around maybe legal or financial matters that might be pending. Those are required to be disclosed as well. I don't see them often, but if they are something that's a reality for a franchise, they do have to disclose them here. You'll also see details around the costs. And we'll talk about this in a few slides again, but you know, we've already spoken about the one-time franchise fee, but I'm gonna show you a slide in a few minutes that's gonna show you some of the other component costs that are um, required in a franchise in order to open for business, whether it's open your doors, cut your ribbon, declare yourself officially open. They're also gonna suggest that you have working capital, right? So this is funds that you would wanna have on hand in order to fund your business, particularly in the early stages, maybe when you haven't gotten up to break even yet, right? Businesses, as they open up, they track through, eventually get to break even, and then eventually go to cash flow positive and profit. But you wanna have some working capital and usually the franchisor will guide you on what that working capital budget ought to be for your business. You'll also see the declaration about what those royalties are and what the percentages are and the frequency of when they're collected. And then there's gonna be a series of details around the franchise contract, the agreement itself. What are those expectations both ways? And so you start to see here, it's things like obligations between the franchisor and the franchisee. So really important, what can you expect from the franchisor in terms of delivering for you? but also what is the franchise or expecting back from you as a franchisee. There'll also be detail about how those territories or territory is defined, how it's drawn, whether it's exclusive or whether it's shared. Then this next section actually, I think is probably the most powerful section of the FDD itself. Every FDD will list for you the current franchisees and their contact information for those who are already operating in the system. And the reason why I say I think this is very important is when I introduce candidates to franchises and they start their research, there's no question that they're going to hear a lot from the franchisor in, and that's going to help them to make their informed decision. But I also say it's important to talk to other franchisees that are already in that system. So this is your opportunity to triangulate the information you've heard from the franchisor that you've learned and confirming how the experience of other franchisees has been. So very important part of the process. The franchisor will always share at some point in the discovery phase, names of franchisees who you can contact. They call that validation. But what I also encourage my clients to do is let's look at the FDD together and let's find some other names that the franchisor didn't give you. And let's see how we can connect with those people. Maybe it's through LinkedIn or otherwise and get their perspective as well, just to make sure that it tracks the same as the references that the franchisor gave you themselves. The other thing is you're gonna see an earnings claim. So there is financial information most of the time in these FDDs, it's not an earnings promise, right? But you'll get a sense from looking at that earnings as to what's been the history of others who are in this business, as to how the business has performed, how it's grown. So. If, Every franchisor will lay out their um, financial earnings claims differently, but it's a really important basis for you to then be able to build your own pro forma so that you can understand what your return on investment might be from this business. You'll also see financial statements from the franchisor themselves. So that gives you a lens into their financial stability, making sure that you are happy that their balance sheet looks sound um, and well capitalized. And then there's going to be some uh, some pieces in here, policies and, and guidance around things like if you have a manager in this business and you're not operating it directly yourself, um, what's the expectation around the training and the role of that manager? Um, these agreements oftentimes are 10-year franchise agreements, so sometimes longer than most marriages in the United States, sadly enough. But you know, if you're getting into something like that, you this is probably a little bit of a prenup, right? Because you'll be, get to see um, what the renewal requirements are, um, what does termination look like if you decide to terminate early, and if you were to transfer. So if there's any restrictions or considerations around any of those scenarios, um, that's where it's going to be spelled out in the FDD. All right. 
So what I'm going to talk about next is I thought I'd just throw in some recent trends. You know, franchising has been around for, gosh, quite a few years, right? But um, the recent trends, um, are, I think, are, are relevant for us to talk about for a minute. Um, so the first one I want to call out is corporate exits are still predominantly the employee's choice. And so what does that mean? It means that um, we're not in a state right now, or and I hope we're, we're not anytime soon, where People are coming into franchising because they've lost the work. They've been downsized from what they were doing before. But what's really interesting is since the pandemic, work from home has really woken people up to the idea of greater independence, flexibility, control of their time. And so we've seen a lot of people coming into franchising because they've chosen to explore it as a next option, not because they're out of work and need to find something to do, okay? Okay. Um, the other thing is franchisors are, are becoming more diversified in their in their offerings, right? So um, I'll give you an example. I've been working with a landscaper. He's a local landscaper. He's an independent. He's built a great business for himself, but he's been starting to think about income diversification. And while he wants to develop a second income stream, he doesn't necessarily want to start all over again. He still has the PTSD of having started his own business years ago on his own. And so he's been attracted to franchising. And we've been talking about concepts in franchising that maybe help him connect to the same client base that already knows, likes, and trusts him. So it's a great way for him to accelerate his growth, but still achieve that diversification of income. What business is he looking at? He's a a landscaper, he's actually looking at an outdoor lighting franchise business because he can bring that back to the same customers who his team is already on the ground with today, uh, you know, handling their their lawns and whatnot, right? The other thing that's going on is there's this whole race for talent, right? Um, everywhere we look, we hear about where am I going to get my employees? And I would say some of the more sophisticated franchisors are starting to offer additional services and help in helping you accelerate uh, recruitment strategies. These are always gonna be your employees. I wanna be clear, the franchisor does not participate in any way in the decision around the selection, the hiring, or the, the retention of your employees, but they might have some strategies and ideas about how to be um, quicker and more successful at building that team that you're gonna need to start your business. Those franchisors these days are getting attention because we're all trying to chase for the same talent. And then the last one is this owner executive model. You know, franchising really grew up uh, probably in the in the environment where the owner was the operator, right? They didn't they left whatever it was they were doing and they jumped into this franchise and and they were the ones operating it. But these days, more and more people are thinking ahead, and you know whether it be maybe trying to accelerate their own retirement out of uh, whatever it is that they do in their day job, or again this idea of income diversification, there's quite a few franchises that will operate in what we call the owner executive model. And um, it doesn't mean that it's the only model they operate in, but for people who are thinking about adding an additional income stream, owning a business, but not necessarily walking away from what they do today, there's some pretty interesting examples in franchising that have a track record of being successful in that. And then the last one I would say is this idea of recession resistant business. You know, I think for the last two, three years, we've wondered, you know, is a recession coming? And I'm going to show you in the next slide um, some of the examples of some recession resistant businesses. I'm just going to pause for a minute. I think we've got um, we've got a question here. Thanks, Corey. Is the franchise are supposed to share franchise earnings to give ideas of what can be made? Yeah, that that's what I was referencing when I was talking about the earnings claim, right? And uh, again, I just want to stress, it's not a promise, right? But you would, um, you know, you could first off see what's in the franchise disclosure document around earnings, but also um, make sure that you're reading the fine print and that you're understanding um, what's the universe or the sample that the franchisor has put in. Because oftentimes it's not going to be the entirety of their system, but they are going to show you some representative examples. Maybe it's the corporate locations they operate or maybe it's the top quartile of their performers in their system. Um, so it's all great information, but again, first off, read the detail, understand the universe they've given you. And secondly, this is where that validation and that triangulation with existing owners is really powerful because you'll be able to understand and hear 
those owners tell you, have they had that same experience? Maybe it's been better, maybe it's worse, but you'll certainly want to understand why. Okay, so I hope I've answered that. Let me go on to the next slide here. So here's that, we're back to recession resistant industries, right? So people say, great, Jim, I love it, but tell me, what do you mean by that, right? So I'm talking about franchise businesses that tend to thrive in all economic conditions. So on the far left side here, you see the first is growing markets driven by demographics. And I'm not gonna develop each one of these, but let's just take the first one here, senior care, right? The reality in the United States is that we're all getting older. We're an aging population, whether or not the stock market is up or down. And there are some wonderful franchises that serve the senior community, whether that's helping them to age in place at home, whether it's helping them to uh, maybe discover community options for living for their next stage of, of life. Um, but all those businesses are needed. In fact, I was a customer of one of them this past year to help my mom. Um, and it didn't matter what the market was doing at the time, right? I needed their help. So it's a great recession resistant business. Um, also residential repairs, home modifications. Maybe a little bit of that is also a function of the fact that we're all aging out, but whether it's upgrades, maintenance, repairs in your home, um, it doesn't matter right? If the stock market's up or down, if you need these services, you're going to need them. And there's some great options in franchising for you to be thinking about in that business. Let's go to the middle and talk about essential services, right? Um, you know, that, that term has sort of been coined and redefined since the pandemic. But, you know, there's some examples in here of businesses that have been determined to be um, essential services, right? So if we did have another pandemic, uh, these are the kinds of business that are going to still be able to uh, to operate. Look at commercial cleaning services, right? I mean, that business was always important, right? I mean, who wants to walk into um, a, a business presence and find that it looks like a mess? But since the pandemic, even more critical that commercial cleaning um, was 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 up to standard. And there's some wonderful options in franchising around that. Tutoring services. Um, these days, what I'm finding is everyone wants to help their children get that advantage and that next step up. So whether it's um, actual tutoring, or tutoring, uh, where it's an in-presence uh, physical learning center, or maybe it's a home-based tutoring business, um, it could be around single subject or general learning. It could be test preparation. It could just be um, ancillary. You know, think about everything that's going on in the the STEM world these days, there's some really interesting franchises that are helping children um, after school activities, uh, things like that around um, STEM learning and technology and whatnot, right? And then also there's businesses that help other small businesses, right? So, um, you know, whether the market is up or down, businesses that are that are out there, they're going to need help with staffing. They're going to need to continue to reinvest in their digital marketing presence. And there are franchises out there that provide these kinds of services. So hopefully the takeaway from this slide is um, that there are businesses that regardless of whether the markets are up or down, generally they'll perform strong regardless of the economic conditions in the market. So that's a bit about franchising. I'm going to shift a bit now, um, maybe give you a little bit of a lens into how we try to work with people. Because, you know, it says here, not every franchise is for every person. And, and frankly, not every person is for every franchise. So it's really about that whole match process. And, you know, oftentimes when I'm working with a candidate, um, I ask them what they've done prior to engaging with me to start their journey of franchise learning. And oftentimes I hear, well, I was Googling a bunch of things. And, and you know, it's great, right? We have all this power right at our fingertips with our computers these days. But if you think back to what we saw in an earlier slide, there's over 4,000 franchises in the United States. So that's an awful lot of information for someone to be digesting and synthesizing on their own. And that's really where we come in in, in terms of FranNet. Our whole process really is built around these seven steps, if you like. So it's really six steps. It looks like we skipped a number four, sorry. But um, these six steps of our process. And I'm going to just develop each of these so you can get an understanding and maybe think about whether this is um, an area where we might be able to help you if this is where you're at. The first one is, are you a good candidate, right? So I can assure you the first couple of conversations that I'm having with someone who's thinking about franchising, we're not going to talk a single minute about any individual franchise itself. 
we're really going to be, my job is to understand you, right? Um, we talked before, are you someone who's going to follow a system, right? What does your funding picture look like? Have you thought about how you might fund this business if we find you the right one? What's your timing, right? Because the last thing I want to do is connect you to franchisors prematurely if this is something that's maybe 12 or 18 months out for you. And sometimes that's really where someone's at, right? What's your own support system look like, right? So what is your spouse and your family saying about this, right? Because trust me, business ownership for yourself, it has its moments, right? And you want to know that the person who's owning this, the franchisee, has a good support system, people who are encouraging him or her to carry on and to, um, to be the leader they need to be in their business. And I guess back to, are they real, realistic in their expectations? And oftentimes I find it's really around the financials where we have to make sure that someone is being realistic. And again, that FDD, that earnings claim, the conversations with other franchisees, that's gonna help confirm what the experience of others has been. But then we need to make sure that that matches your expectations as well, and that you're prepared for you know that startup period of a business. Because there is going to be a startup period of your business, right? Before it gets to the point where it's achieving the kind of financial goals that you are looking for. The second thing we do is we um, we have an assessment tool that we use at Frannet. It's a proprietary tool and it's not a personality test. But what it is, is it's really a tool that profiles you against other successful owners in the franchise space. And, you know, sometimes this is as far as some of my candidates go. They just want to take this profile. They want to see what it tells them about themselves. I think it's an amazing tool. It helps you to understand what your transferable skills might be. It starts to help you and I together put a finger on what your goals and your motivations are for business ownership. But, um, and it, it comes in written form, right? So, um, you know, there's a link to this. People take it. Um, I always give it back to them. And I offer a sit down session if they want to talk this through and answer their questions. And sometimes that's as far as it goes for someone. That's as far as they're ready to go at this point in time. So I'd encourage you to think about that. If you're thinking about business ownership, whether it's a franchise or not, I think you'll get some insights about yourself by considering taking something like this entrepreneurial profile. The other thing we want to understand as we start to build your business model is what does your timeline look like, right? So, um, you know, different people come to, to business ownership with different um, long-term goals. Some people, they want to be in it for the 10 years of the franchise agreement, and then they want to get out. Others, they want to think about whether they have a sellable asset at the other side of this that they can pass on to someone else, sell to someone else. Or maybe it's about legacy in their family. I have clients that say that they want to bring their children into the business once the children get to adult age. The other thing, too, is, is where does this timeline sit against what you consider to be retirement? And what is retirement? What is that lifestyle looking like for you? Because part of what I want to do is make sure that I'm helping you to think about franchises that are going to have that. Maybe it's that part time requirement that you are looking for down the road um, as you get nearer to what you're considering to be retirement. So we talk about timeline. And then the other part of business model is we'll talk about every one of these sections of this wheel that you see here to understand what's your vision, right? So what kind of customers are you looking to serve? Do you want to serve consumers? Do you want to serve children, adults, seniors? Do you want to serve businesses? Um, what kind of employees do you want to have? Are they full-time? Are they part-time? Are they technical? Um, are they more technical than you perhaps, right? Some businesses require someone who has technical skills that you'll never possess, but they're important cont contributors to your business in order for you to, um, to, uh, to be successful, right? What is that business environment looking like? I is this a physical presence business or are you operating this from home? Or as I said, mobile before, how many units do you want to have, right? I want to make sure that I'm, I'm helping you think about franchises that match to the growth uh, ambitions that you have, right? So if I'm showing you a franchise in your area that doesn't have a lot of availability, but you know you want to be a territory owner of four or five territories. Maybe that's we've got to look at something else, right? Um, so those are just a couple of examples. But what we do is I lead a discussion where we document and define that business model, and then 
that becomes my clients to own so that they can always reference back as they're researching the franchises I introduce them to as to how closely does it match against that business model that we built together. Okay. Talk again about financially prepared. This is usually a surprise to people. Everyone thinks franchises cost millions of dollars, and maybe that's because everyone immediately thinks about things like McDonald's, right? But you know, look at this slide here. You know, look at look at how many businesses are actually financially attainable for many people. And, and we haven't even begun to talk about whether you're using all of your own capital or maybe you're using a funding strategy where you're doing a loan or whatnot. You know, but I would say, generally speaking, the franchises that I connect my clients to fall in a range of about 150000 to 300000 all in for that startup investment. And more often than not, my clients are not funding all of that themselves. They are looking at things like a loan or there are some opportunities to use retirement assets as well toward funding your business. But, you know, this is think of this as the total investment needed to throw that door open, declare yourself open. Um, so surprisingly, maybe more attainable than you thought coming to this meeting today. I should say that there's also franchises I connect people to that are below 150000 all in but also ones that are more than the 300,000 as well. So it's really about what's your budget and then also what are your goals? And that's what I'm gonna help you talk about franchises that maybe are could be a match for you. Here's a little bit more granularity. Um, this is also an example of what you'll see in a franchise disclosure document in one of the other sections. The franchisor will not only show you what that total cost to get in looks like, but they'll show you a range, a high and a low, against each of the individual line items. In fact, many of them go further and they show you the ones that are paid to the franchisor versus which are costs that go to the outside world, maybe to a third party vendor. But you know, if you as you look at these categories, think about it, with the exception of that franchise fee at the top line, pretty much every one of those other expenses that you see there, if you were gonna go get into that business yourself, but not go through a franchise, but actually open that business on your own, I would venture a guess that you're going to encounter every single one of those line items yourself. And in fact, some of them, you might even end up spending more because you don't have that purchasing power we talked about before. So this example here, this is a what they call, you know, a budget, you know, haircut retail store, right? So you've got the franchise fee, you've got some rent, you're going to have some furniture. You know, if we look at the big ticket items, then oftentimes, you know, you'll see the working capital in there. So again, that's money that you're budgeting and that they're disclosing to you that you'll want to have on hand as you're in those early days of your business. But think of that as money that you're basically paying to yourself to keep your business operating as it grows. Here's another example. This is a residential home cleaning business. So this is maybe a home-based business, whereas before the, the one we saw before the haircut, that's going to require a physical space. But if you look at this residential home cleaning example, you don't see a, a, um, a rent, a lease, or a tenant improvement example here or a listing because this business is going to operate from someone's home. So maybe home-based businesses tend to be more um, or less, less expensive because there isn't that commitment of brick and mortar and a build-out and a commitment to a lease. But pretty much everything else is going to be there as well. But like I said, you'll always see in the franchise disclosure document the details of the component costs that the franchisor um, sees as being critical and most prevalent in terms of getting another location started in their operating model, okay? Um, I'm not gonna make you a funding expert here, but I think the biggest thing I, I would hope you take away from this is there's surprisingly a lot more ways to fund part of your business than maybe the, what you were thinking about. The traditional way we often think about is some sort of going to a financial institution, getting an SBA loan, and that's a great option, right? But um, you know, you also see, I've seen clients using home equity lines of credit. Um, I've seen uh, some crowdfunding from friends and relatives. I'd love to have those friends and relatives myself. Um, but also in the middle, uh, there's, there's also strategies to use retirement assets. So um, the thing that's important to just know here is that those retirement assets, if you were to use some or all of your retirement assets to fund the startup of your business, you um, can do that in a way that is both tax-free and penalty-free. 
So I'm not going to take you into the weeds on that. I've got some wonderful partners who do, all they do is franchise funding. And that's someone I connect my clients to so that they can learn from them if they're starting to think seriously about a franchise. But just know that there are a lot of options. And it's really about just understanding your situation to see what those options might be for you. Okay. And then I'm going to whiz through this quickly, but the remaining steps in the process after we've built that business model is really for me to do my job of coming back to you with some possible options, right? So sitting down with you and walking you through franchises that I think support the business model that we built together, that is your vision for business. But I'm not only just going to give you the name and tell you what they do, but it's my job to make sure that I'm explaining to you, why do I think that business was a match for you? What is it about that business that speaks to some of that vision that you had when you built your business model with me? Okay. So I usually like to bring four to six options. Um, I support a process where we can, you know, tick away and start to narrow the field. But a lot of that is going to be um, a function of you starting the research process, right? So part of, the advantage of working with a consultant like myself is I can help you engage with that franchisor probably more quickly than what you will get on your own um, because I'm bringing them to I'm bringing you to them but I'm also bringing you to them because I know you're a qualified candidate with a higher probability of a match between what they're looking for and what you're bringing to the table and what your vision is so that research process you know, it's not unusual for that to go six, eight, 10 weeks because it's a process of elimination and it's a process of learning. And for clients of mine who already have a day job, remember they're fitting this in alongside being in that day job. So we have to be realistic with our time, but at some point in time, you are gonna get to sort of that marriage decision, right? So it's decision time. Is this a go or a no-go? And the thing I always like to stress here is I don't care, I mean, of course, I'd love to see you um, connect with the franchise, but it has to be the right one for you. And if the decision you're making at the end is to not step into that franchise, I will always respect that. All of us at FranNet, that's how we operate. But we also just love to learn more about why you came to that decision that you did. It helps us to understand you, maybe for a follow-on discussion, or it maybe just helps us to become better at what we do as well. But there is the ultimately that decision time. And I, I just want to also bring up here, that decision is two-way, right? So one thing to always remember, if you do start to look at a franchise, as much as you're making your decision about the franchise or, trust me, they are making their decision about you. They are, you know, their territories that they have to sell and give away are precious to them. And they want to make sure that you are the right kind of owner to come in and be part of their system. Whether that be, how will you be in their culture, as well as how will you follow a system and what are your ambitions for growth? So, you know, things like honoring the meetings that you make with the franchisor, showing up and being prepared, asking good questions. I mean, I know these sound like common sense things, but trust me, they are data points that the franchisor is using to evaluate whether they want to offer the franchise to you and because that's really what they're doing at the end of this process they are extending an offer for you to become a franchisor and then it's your decision as to whether you want to say yes or no to that okay so you know hopefully what you've seen in all this i mean we we say in in franchising you know you're in business for yourself but not by yourself right i mean I'm, i made the reference before about how much i relied on uh, the national hair care franchisees that i had to my left and my right it's so true Right. I mean, it's so exhilarating to be my own business owner, but at the same time, knowing that I had this um, safety net around me of other people who probably knew, forgot more than I was ever going to learn in that business. That was a great comfort to me. So it's uh, it's a great business model to be an, an entrepreneur, uh, an independent. Um, yes, it, it comes with its own stresses like everything does, but at the same time, you're not alone in a business like this. So I hope if it is something that you've been thinking about, Hopefully you're coming out of this uh, maybe a little bit more confident as to what does it require and, and thinking about whether it's whether it's a match for you. All right. Corey asked a question. Can we bring franchises to you to review? Um, yeah, I see that two ways, Corey. Um, the first one is uh, someone might have their eye on a franchise and they want to come back to me and, and ask me for my opinion. Uh, you know, I, I'm 
I, I might not know that business well enough to offer an opinion because it's not in our inventory in our portfolio as, per se. Um, but, you know, I might have a perspective on the industry class itself and what I've seen about people who've been successful in that industry. The other thing that comes up sometimes is I sometimes get business owners approaching me who have been really successful at building their independent business on their own. And now they're thinking about whether they want to franchise that business. That isn't something that we support directly at FranNet, but we do have ways to introduce successful business owners who are thinking about franchise as their catalyst for future growth to um, we can connect them with the types of advisors and resources that will really help them uh, move through that process. One, to evaluate, is this the right time? And then two, to help them make it happen because there's an awful lot of um, ticking and tying. And, you know, I mentioned the Federal Trade Commission before. You can imagine in a regulated business like this, there's an awful lot of requirements not only at the national level, but also at individual state levels to um, basically get a business ready to convert itself into becoming a franchise. So if I can help there in terms of making the introduction, I'd be happy to do that as well. Moira asks, is a franchise required to provide a copy of the FDD to anyone who requests? Yes, it is a requirement to disclose that FDD. And in fact, you will sign a receipt back to the franchise or acknowledging that you have received that FDD, okay? Each franchise will have its own place in its process as to where they hand that FDD over to you. I've seen some who hand it over early. I see others who maybe it's a few, it's a bit later, a few steps later, they've, you know, they, they wanna share more with you around understanding the operating model things like that. But yes, the, the FDD disclosure is a requirement. Um, so you, you, will see, uh, you will see an FDD if you're getting into a process of studying individual franchises. Okay, I think that was everything that was in our Q&A. What are red flags? <laughs> I see Corey just gave us another one. Thank you. What are red flags when doing franchise research? Um, you know, like I said, I, I mean, my experience, I, I, I think generally speaking, like I said, we're, we're pretty picky about the franchises we will introduce to. So I'm going to answer this from my perspective, um, which is I, I feel like we already work with a lot of the top shelf franchises um, in terms of introductions. But the red flags are, um, you know, if you're going through the process and, and you um, you start to talk to other franchisees and you hear pain points from them around um, how they've grown their business or maybe the support they're seeing from the franchise. Or um, I think the biggest one is also, you know, I mentioned before that there's that owner executive model, right? So in an owner exec model, you've still got a plan that you as the owner are going to put probably at least 10 hours a week against your business. You might have a general manager that's running it for you, but there's going to be a requirement for you to put time against that business as well. It's not going to be necessarily hands-on, but you know it, it's going to be looking at the metrics and guiding the business as you need to working with that general manager. And sometimes what I find is that, um, uh, you know, again, fr franchises uh, might describe it as owner executive, but you really got to get underneath it and understand what does that requirement look like? Because you want to make sure that it matches the time that you have to give to that business, right? Because otherwise you, you're not going to be successful. You're going to get frustrated. So those are just a couple of examples of, of red flags. You know, I always say to people, if you see something that's just not feeling right, throw it at the franchise or right in your discussions with them, bring up what you're feeling or seeing or bring it to me and let's talk about it, right? Especially if you see something that doesn't feel right to you, how the franchisor responds to that and how they acknowledge that, I think sometimes tells you as much about their culture as anything you're going to read. What are the most time non-consuming franchises? Oh, this is a dangerous question. Like I said, everything requires some time. What do we know in life that is set it and forget it? Probably nothing, right? Um, I think that that's probably the kind of thing that we would wanna talk about. I'd wanna understand what's your time budget that you can give so that I can properly answer that for you. But there are even some franchises these days that are calling themselves an investor model where the franchisor has put a management company in place. You're gonna pay an extra fee to that management company for some of that oversight, but it's gonna set your role up 
to feel more like maybe an angel investor or a board director as opposed to someone who's putting hours and hours against that business. But I think that that question is really very specific to each individual. So, you know, if 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 it's something that I can help you with as you start your research, let's talk about it. I'm happy to do that as well. All right. I'm going to put up my contact info here. Um, here we go. And so this is me. Um, and you have my email here. You have a QR code if you want to get connected. I do um, a fair amount of education and opportunities for continued learning. So if you scan that QR code there, you'll be able to um, get added to the list. You'll also see on LinkedIn, uh, if you're on LinkedIn, I have a LinkedIn profile. I put a lot of that education out onto LinkedIn. You'll also understand a little bit more about what I bring to the party as a consultant in this space. So again, feel free. There's my number. There's my email. I'm very happy to take any calls that you have after today uh, to see uh, how I might be able to help you or help you continue to learn. That's what we do at FranNet. 90% of our time is education. The rest is that matching process I was taking you through. But thank you, everybody. Leo Lung, if, if it's okay, I'll throw it back to you to close this out. Yeah, great. Uh, I will just put up a couple of closing slides, but just to let anybody know, if you do have any more questions for Jim, if you could type those into the Q&A, that would be fantastic. And to let Jim know that the audio came out really good. The first, uh, the first slide, the introductory, things were a little scary there for a second or two, but the rest of it um, came through fantastic for me. Oh, so great. I was well, glad to that, see. That first slide was just about me. So who cares? <laughs> we the, we the yeah, we, we got, got the rest there. of it then. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, <laughs> it didn't end up being too bad. Um, and then we do have your contact information um, at, at the end. So let's see. I always think I'm on the right slide and then I somehow mess it up and I have to scroll through. So let's see. Here we are. We have our uh, questions right there. There might be something in Q&A right now. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, yes, there. they wanna know how we get a copy of this webinar. Um, all participants will receive uh, a copy of the webinar and the slides in your email. So usually that takes us a day or two to get that to you, but you will have um, a copy of the slides and this presentation in your email in just a day or two. That way you can scan the QR code if you need to get a hold of Jim with a, a question a little bit later. Happy to help. And if we don't have anything else, that's just a reminder of how you can find us at SCORE. Um, that would be score.org backslash Minnesota. And let's see, oops, there we go. Uh, We'd like to thank all of our participants for attending today. We will send you a survey so you can let us know what we can do to improve or other topics that you may be interested in. And if we don't have anything else, uh, Jim, thank you so much. Appreciate it and really uh, found that super interesting. Like I told you, kind of had a franchise myself. Yeah. So, uh, really, really enjoyed your presentation Great. today. Well, I, I love when people are curious. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And, and uh, I hope we continue the conversation if this is the right thing for you. All right. Thanks. Everybody. Great. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye now.